Welcome to the discussion series on free trade and liberalization as part of the 1991 project at the Mercatus Center. I am Shruti Rajagopalan, and in this conversation series, I will be talking trade with Professor Arvind Panagarya, who is the director of the Deepak and Meera Raj Center on Indian Economic Policies and the Jagdish Bhagwati Professor of Indian Political Economy at Columbia University. In the past, he has served as the first vice chairman of the Niti Aayog in Government of India and as chief economist of the Asian Development Bank. He is the author of a number of books, but today's conversation will primarily focus around Indian trade policy with some insights from his recent book, Free Trade and Prosperity. We've covered some, uh, you know, very basic insights on what kind of trade models exist, what they inform us about the world and, you know, economic policy more generally, uh, what we can learn in terms of insights for developing countries and how developing countries can prosper. And if at all, there are any valid arguments uh, against trade and in favor of protectionist policies. Uh, but now I want to zoom in a little bit more on India specifically. I know we've sort of, you know, uh, brought the conversations and talked about some Indian examples, but I really want to dig into Indian trade policy. Uh, and I want to start uh, rather at the beginning. Uh, so one of the things that I have observed when I read about, you know, the, the post-colonial period in India, in fact, I would start maybe even pre-independence in the late 1930s and early 1940s. And it was very clear that socialism as an ideology and also socialist planning as an economic policy framework was gaining a lot of momentum and prominence. And, uh, you know, this we can see through throughout the Indian nationalist movement, uh, but in particular, you know, the socialist uh, Congress uh, Socialist Party was brought to uh, sort of prominence in 1934. By 1938, in just a matter of four years, uh, the then Congress president, Subhash Chandra Bose, created the National Planning Committee. And, you know, this was the committee that was tasked with forming an economic plan for India. And, uh, you know, we know now that this committee met so frequently that its secretary, Katie Shah, produced about 20 volumes of papers. And this was simultaneously also going on with the war effort. Uh, you know, a lot of the socialist price controls, quantity controls that, you know, were left as a legacy in India, they really started with the scarcity problems in World War II. And those sort of war controls were a, a new kind of, you know, socialist planning that was taking place in India at the time. And this was really the sort of precursor to the new Indian government under the leadership of Nehru. And to me, it seems like Nehru, along with most of the nationalist leaders in the 40s, uh, conflated British mercantilism uh, with a different economic system, which is free trade and capitalism. And the Indian nationalist movement had always blamed, you know, British rule for the impoverishment of India. This starts with Dadabai Nauroji talking about the extractive policies of the British. Uh, but the conflation that took place in the 1940s in the Indian nationalist movement was that the impoverishment of India was now blamed on British capitalism as opposed to extractive mercantilism. Now, my, my big question to you is, what were the consequences of this kind of conflation, right? What did it mean for, you know, the economic thinking at the time and the economic policy that was being hatched under a new uh, government, which was in this case led by Nehru while writing the constitution and while being in transition from a colonial state uh, to an independent one? Shruti, this is a very good starting point. Uh, so let me pick up where uh, uh, you have brought me already. Um, you know, as far as Nehru is concerned, uh, 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 and, and his own view of, of uh, 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 Great Britain, uh, in some ways, uh, at least particularly, you know, just uh, around the time that uh, the National Planning Committee is appointed, uh, he actually sees capitalism as the evil, uh, uh, the, the fundamental evil. Uh, and, and the way he sees uh, yeah, even uh, what you are calling the mercantilist policies uh, uh, is a necessary outcome of uh, 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 capitalism. 
so so he really very much it's not just mercantilism I mean, he associates capitalism with the emergence of imperialism says that you know uh, capitalism creates these factories and these factories generate a lot of output you need market for output where are you going to get that so you need the, you get them in the colonies and then the factories also need raw materials where are you going to get raw materials you need raw materials from the colonies so he had this very direct kind of association of capitalism with imperialism and so around this time certainly nehru believed that uh, 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 the only way to combat this imperialism uh, uh, was to combat capitalism and therefore socialism was the way to go and of course within the congress there was a lot of consensus uh, 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 yeah. you know subhash chandra bose himself actually was very much aligned uh, to the uh, same view i mean uh, yeah. subhash chandra bose was very much of a, a strong socialist uh, in uh, in this respect yeah. and and uh, uh, nehru also like so both of them really believed uh, 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 also that industrialization was uh, very important uh, and so really the mandate actually to Uh, the planning committee was to think in terms of you know how india was going to industrialize what will be the plan for industrialization in any case and and uh, you also rightly pointed out that the committee really did a uh, lot of hard work and <laughs> at the end actually the committee's work ended only uh, abruptly only because nehru uh, got uh, uh, picked up uh, by the british and put into jail and then he wanted to complete the final volume of, of the work <laughs> and yeah. the, uh, the the british would not let him do that anyway so that's 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 a history but uh, uh, let's come to you know i i'll, I'll uh, really come to uh, 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 what happens after independence independence uh, so the nehruvian view and and here I, I, you know before we get to trade policy we we need to lay down a bit of uh, background of the uh, overall domestic economic policy framework yeah because that, that in a way drives uh, uh, the trade policy uh, as well uh, uh, as we'll see you know if you look at 1950s there is no active trade policy happening at the time yeah but we'll come to that but first you know what was the basic framework so nehru's basic framework was that uh, uh, because capital because imperialism necessarily followed from capitalism uh, and and this was done through international trade so therefore international trade was itself actually to be kind of uh, 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 kept at a distance yeah. uh, and and therefore followed the uh, the idea of self sufficiency so yeah. so it was you know uh, uh, and and he writes he writes that in in the discovery of india saying that you know we had no uh, in the context of the self sufficiency objective that uh, uh, we don't want to be the victims of imperialism nor do we want to develop similar tendencies ourselves yeah <laughs> and therefore you know while while uh, we, we, we are not against a, a trade but but we we want to minimize that so so self sufficiency became a very important centerpiece of the entire policy framework that got adopted and and melon obese of course had started uh, interacting with nehru beginning in 1940 uh uh was not a continuous kind of interaction because nehru spent large part of his uh, uh 1940 in jails prior to independence um but uh, uh, uh nevertheless you know they had begun to understand each other and so later on uh, 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 nehru appointed uh, melanobis uh, as the statistical advisor to the cabinet and so then melanobis came centrally and so basically you know we all Uh, uh, academically, we think uh, of of the basic planning framework as coming from Melanobi's model, which yeah. uh, 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 at some level is correct, but it really is a rationalization of what Nehru thought. I mean, Melanobi was completely aligned to to Nehru's view, and and so what you see, and then he interacted even uh, quite closely with Nehru uh, while he was for. Uh, you know, preparing yeah. the plan frame and the draft plan frame, as as it is not known the document. So, all right. So, so here, uh, uh, where it uh, uh, self sufficiency is the central, but then there are different ways. Nehru, even Nehru knew and Melanobius knew that you can't become self sufficient overnight. Yeah. Uh, 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 you know, so so they knew that it'll take a little while. 
So there are multiple paths to achieving self-sufficiency. But, but the very closely associated big mistake that also happens around this time, uh, which uh, to me, I think, continues to haunt us till today. It's not a problem we were able to solve because the history of uh, the hysteresis is so, so deep, uh, yeah. uh, which, which was the, the uh, uh, focus on uh, the heavy industries. Yeah. I mean, Nehru felt that, you know, uh, 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 unless we learn how to do heavy industries, so learn to make machines, learn to make steel, uh, we would not uh, 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 be self-sufficient. So for self-sufficiency, it was essential. And he talks about, you know, machines that make machines. Yeah. Uh, not just, you know, machines that uh, would make parts of bicycles or automobiles or uh, boilers or uh, uh, air conditioners, yeah. what have you, but uh, uh, machines that also will make the machines that make these parts and so forth. So, so uh, uh, that was the conception. And that I think was, was really practically, I should say, fatal uh, and, and, and ensured that uh, success was not going to happen uh, in any uh, near future. For the simple reason that, you know, you started off with very limited capital. Capital. It was a poor country, so small GDP. And the savings rate was about 7% around the time second five-year plan was being written. Um, so savings were very small. And if you are going to put that in making steel and making machines that make machines, that sort of uh, investment, very highly capital intensive, then you knew that you know, most of the capital will basically get absorbed there. Uh, and they saw that, they knew that. And so they said, well, you know, what, what is happening, going to happen to the consumers? They said, well, consumers will, uh, 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 consumer goods will be produced by this, this, this small village industries. At that time, the Gandhian kind of view of, uh, uh, yeah. you know, promoting the uh, village industries, cottage industries, household industries, uh, uh, and, and it's called the hand industries, meaning, you know, that's yeah. the labor. Uh, uh, they, they refer to these industries as hand industries in many of the documents uh, contemporarily written during the second plan formulation. So they, uh, so they said, well, consumer goods, we leave for the hand industries. Uh, and, and so in a way, you see, uh, the, the, that is the setup that's set up. Now you know what is going to happen as a result of this. Um, first of all, the heavy industry is never going to achieve the kind of scale because your capital is limited and you're trying to diversify very rapidly. So, so it's not that you know you, you, uh, you, you are going to go for a big scale. And diversification was not just in terms of product, but also in terms of uh, uh, geographical diversification. So uh, uh, you know, rather than put a very large scale steel mill, you are going to put up three of them so that you can put them in three different places. So you don't get scale there. And then you do cottage industry, uh, for consumer goods, goods in which you actually got a, got comparative advantage. Well, you don't can't get scale there. Yeah. Uh, and, and then to mobilize resources, uh, uh, the government also used the instrument of printing money. So that, of course, also mean, meant that inflation happened, uh, and the exchange rate. Now, this is the big factor which nobody seems to see or bother with at the time. I think this all reflects the prevailing thinking at the time. Uh, so it's not as though there is any disagreements on this. You know, most people are agreeing and all. And there's a whole a lot of agreement actually on what was being done at the time, including this famous panel of economists, which had uh, uh, 20 economists selected from uh, uh, universities uh, at, uh, in eight different states and all. So, you know, eminent economists collected, they were all there you know, and largely, you know, except uh, uh, B.R. Shanoi uh, making it sort of a, a decent note. Uh, and uh, from the Bombay School, uh, uh, C.N. Vakil and B.R. Uh, Brahmanand, you know, uh, writing something to the contrary, although still not uh, dissenting formally. Uh, but the rest of the panel actually is, is in agreement and all. So it's not as though what was being done uh, was, was, was uh, 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 contested at the time by almost anybody. Um, but you know, the, 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 the fact of the matter is that uh, if your nominal exchange rate is fixed, inflation is higher, then you know that domestic prices are way more lucrative on everything. Mm -hmm. 
when the foreign prices are. So exports will suffer, you know that. Uh, also imports will want to come in because imports are a lot cheaper with the no fixed nominal exchange rate and uh, uh, domestic prices rising. Uh, now, on top of that, what you are doing is you haven't got really serious scale of production either in the heavy industries or in the uh, uh, consumer light uh, industries. Uh, so so you, your cost of production therefore are high everywhere. And, and because the exchange rate is fixed, they are high <laughs> uh, in rupee terms in almost everything. Yeah. So, so your competitiveness, you know, so, so you, you, you see this transformation that happens in most developing countries where they become exporters of, develop, of, of labor intensive products. This didn't happen in, in, in India. Uh, yeah. and, and that is the sort of background to, 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 to the whole uh, system. Uh, yeah. But against that background, you know, perhaps we can come to, come to the uh, discussion of the how the policy itself the trade policy itself yeah and you know before i get into the the mechanics of the trade policy i would actually highlight two or three more unintended consequences of going in the direction of heavy industry so you know one part of one of the unintended consequences was uh, to actually have these heavy industries perform and hire from within india you needed to produce engineers Right. And, and, you know, uh, sort of, you know, scientists, engineers, applied work uh, to set up these industries and run these industries, which meant that a lot of the government uh, focus in education went towards higher education. Right. And it went towards necessarily setting up IITs and engineering colleges and things like that. And the vision was this is the modern way to go because it's science at its highest level. But we know that, you know, in a country, a fraction is going to be, you know, engineers, right? So if your education policy is entirely designed for as an input for heavy industry, you are in trouble already, right? So you become very good at producing engineers and not very good at producing other kinds of human capital. So I think that was one unintended consequence. The other, you know, partially unintended, partially intended is because the government is going to invest in heavy industry and they want to acquire a certain kind of scale. When it comes to, you know, what they're calling hand industries or cottage industry, the second fatal blow is the small scale industry reservation list. Right. Uh, so this is basically a list of, uh, you know, sectors or industries which are supposed to remain small. They cannot exceed an investment of more than a certain amount of money. And that means that anyone who wants to be an entrepreneur and eventually achieve scale, that is, you know, if you want to be in the government business and you want to supply garments to Zara across the world or something like that, you are necessarily not going to be doing that in a labor intensive way because you're going to fall in the category of one of those industries, right? Whether it's making shoes or whether it's making handicraft. So there is this really complicated relationship that the government seems to have with scale, right? Uh, where scale is thought of as one of the achievable goals and not as an output of really successful or a really productive uh, enterprise in the first place. Absolutely. No, I mean, the, you know, long-term effects really go a lot deeper, you, you know, so not only what you have just mentioned, but uh, just think of what you said about cottage industries or hand industries. A lot of the low-level skills are, are, are developed precisely in these industries. This is where the skill formation begins. Yeah. But once you say there's a hand industry, is no capital allowed. Uh, 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 other than the household capital, whatever, you know, uh, get your needles yeah. and get your, uh, you know, uh, 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 threads and so forth, but uh, uh, charkha and so, you know, so, but, but the industrial skills will simply not, not be uh, uh, developed uh, if, if uh, in those industries uh, you don't allow. Uh, so, so on the one hand, you know, you are developing these engineers and uh, very high level uh, technical expertise. On the other, in terms of low-level skills, uh, from which vast population begins to kind of rise up, yeah, that's not happening, you know. So, so you, uh, so you, you, you still see, and the impact today remains, you know, that, yeah. that our, our workforce is the least skilled workforce today uh, after seventy-five years of uh, uh, near seventy-five years of independence. 
So much deeper, you know, and, and the impact that this leaves, because you see, there is also this inheritance in terms of thinking. So the socialist thinking doesn't end with Nehru. I mean, it's inherited. Yeah. And yeah. so, you know, all the major actors, politicians, journalists, intellectuals, bureaucracy, yeah. in every one of these influential classes of people, yeah. socialism has its inheritance. And this is where, you know, there's a book I'm working on right now, uh, where I'm going to bring all this. Uh, but, but, you know, this is where democracy and socialism is 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 a uh, 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 sort of uh, cocktail <laughs> that is lethal. That's lethal. Um, uh, 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 you know, in contrast, remember that China had a, had the more or less the same model, but because it was authoritarian, Deng Xiaoping could come along and tell everybody, "Okay, old game is over. Yeah, new game is beginning." Yeah. In a democracy, that doesn't happen. I mean, even think 1991 when Narsimha Rao begins to kind of make changes, he never says that I'm changing. He says, no, it's a continuation. I mean, yeah. read, uh, you know, if you read the uh, speech by Manmohan Singh, in some ways it's a fantastic speech. But yeah. in other ways, he's also, uh, you know, saying we are connected to Rahul, what Rajiv Gandhi did, we are connected to what Nehru did. Uh, yeah. So that is that connection drawn because in democracy that's how you you, you have to move very slowly gradually and all and, yeah. and, and even you see the the way this uh, ideology left the impact comes along 2009 to 14 right upa2 socialist policies reassert themselves right you know right to education act very much a socialist uh, act uh, and the uh, uh, land acquisition act very much a socialist act uh, uh, you, uh, you, you see, and remember who is running the uh, the finance ministry around this time. You got uh, Pranab Mukherjee, pretty much a committed socialist. So, uh, so the, the impact of what Nehru did remains till a long time through all these uh, uh, inheritances. These inheritances yeah. that happened, you know. I mean, it's like you inherit ethics from your family. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, but the new new IAS officers who come in learn from the senior ones that are in existence, and yeah. so they then take their mantle and carry the work forward. And so this, yeah. you know, uh, 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 you can see it till today. Journalists, intellectuals, uh, uh, bureaucrats, politicians, still kind of you know. So so yeah. the, the the damage, you know, long term damage is 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 significantly significantly uh, yeah. wider and, and, and deeper and, and long lasting. In one sense, self-sufficiency, as you discussed, is uh, going in the direction of heavy industry, homegrown, home cultivated heavy industry. But another way that self-sufficiency eventually emerges in India is uh, some kind of, you know, autarkic trade model. Uh, but before we get to the later years of autarky, can you tell us a little bit about sort of, you know, the, the domestic trade policy in the 40s and, and, and 50s at this, at this point, what was being thought through, you know, what were the models being used? What were the ideas being debated? So, yeah, that's a good, good uh, uh, way to begin the discussion on trade policy. Uh, so, you know, uh, as you know, uh, originally, of course, uh, the British had imposed on India free trade policy. Uh, meaning that goods in India could enter uh, without any custom duties and whatever little custom duties that got imposed were uh, like to raise revenues. So, you know, there'll be two and a half percent, five percent, something like that. Uh, it's only in a, a real sense uh, the, the what we trade, you know, what we would call uh, the protective uh, trade policy uh, that uh, which which is different from the revenue raising you know re revenue is a different uh, because you can't you know at that time commodity internal commodity taxation is harder so uh, at the border it is easier to to collect taxes uh, so for revenue purposes you do that so that little bit of uh, that was perhaps done uh, earlier uh, uh, but but really it's in the 1920s that uh, uh, at the at, at the you know, uh, and lobbying by uh, the Indian industry, uh, some bit of tariffs got introduced uh, in the 1920s. Uh, these were in iron and steel and textile. 
those were the two kind of major industries that had uh, uh, evolved in, in India. And, and the, uh, 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 other than jute textiles, of course, also. Uh, but so some custom duties got introduced that remained in place that, that uh, were inherited. Then came the war. Uh, so during the uh, Second World War is when you know you begin you you began to um, uh, to to uh, 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 put in place the control kind of uh, uh, system and uh, uh, initially kind of you know in 1940s you started with some import controls on the consumer goods uh, this was as early as 1940. Uh, then by 1942, this was extended to practically all goods. So you put yeah. in these import controls, uh, uh, meaning license licensing uh, on imports. Uh, but uh, uh, you know there was no specific quantities that were fixed up for these. These you know you just needed a license, uh, which could be given to you uh, if if uh, 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 foreign exchange was available and so forth. Uh, during this period also. Uh, they begin to evolve the principle of essentiality. Now, later it plays a very important role, of course, you know, uh, in yeah. the entire import policy regime, as we will see. But the principle of essentiality is evolved during this period. Uh, uh, although imports from sterling area uh, um, were regulated mainly because of the shipping restrictions. Uh, yeah. Because, you know, anything that had to do with war had priority uh, in terms of the usage of uh, availability of, of shipping capacity. So yeah. subject to shipping capacity availability, I think still products were allowed to be, uh, be traded, imported and exported. So, so that's a rough kind of uh, regime that uh, we inherit uh, uh, after independence. Uh, towards the end, you know, uh, 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 of the British era, 1945, 1946, uh, the idea of open general licensing had been evolved already also. Uh, this also later on in the 1980s uh, uh, it plays a very important role in India's liberalization, early liberalization prior to the 91 liberalization. So we got, you know, uh, uh, that uh, so basic machinery, as you see, the import licensing, the principle yeah. of essentiality, uh, open general licensing. This is all order, already kind of evolved from, from the uh, British period before we became independent. Uh, and uh, some expansion of the open general licensing list uh, was uh, done in 1948. Uh, uh, um, but at the same time, you know, uh, this was a period uh, we had a very hyperactive joint secretary and finance ministry, BK Nehru. Uh, he was very worried about the foreign exchange and all. So temporarily he had introduced the foreign exchange budgeting, uh, but then uh, BK Nehru got uh, uh, transferred to become the executive director of India at the International Monetary Fund. <laughs> so the, the minister then uh, uh, issued an order saying uh, 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 abolishing abolishing the budgeting. Uh, I mentioned this you know this historical fact, which is quite important, you know, because later on BK Nehru returns uh, <laughs> and so does uh, foreign exchange budgeting <laughs> during his yeah. period. And once again, it's it's his initiative that, of course, uh, introduces the foreign exchange budgeting. So, so we'll come to that. But this is the, the, the very early history. Now, the first, uh, you know, uh, planning period, 1950s, uh, uh, that is generally a liberal period uh, uh, as uh, licensing existed. But, you know, licenses were uh, issued with relative ease uh, and uh, you know, two major categories of licenses were, uh, uh, one was the established importer and the other was uh, uh, the actual user licenses. Uh, on, all these things continue, you know, as, uh, and, and become very, very important later on uh, as the licensing uh, regime uh, tightens up later on. So uh, now what, what happens is that uh, uh, in the 1950s, uh, because of India's war effort, India had earned a lot of sterling balances from Great Britain. Now, there were some restrictions on how much you could draw these sterling balances every year. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so uh, the British will not release the entire pot of the sterling balances at once, but you know, every mm -hmm. year they will release them. That fact, plus the fact that during the 1950s, the food situation luckily remained uh, uh, pretty reasonable and we didn't have to import food on a large scale. Uh, uh, some imports had happened, but largely we were able to meet our needs uh, during the 1950s. 
So both of those factors left sufficient amount of foreign exchange uh, uh, to uh, 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 allow relatively freely uh, imports. So import license. So even you know uh, during this is a period during which you see that consumer goods imports uh, are also coming in. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, 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 according to the third five-year plan, gives the data, uh, at least the aggregate data. So it says you know during first five-year plan, about 32 percent of total imports uh, uh, were consumer goods. So they declined from 32 to 23 percent in the second plan. But by the end of the second plan, of course, uh, the, the uh, trade regime really gets gets uh, very much tighter. Uh, and and uh, uh, the share of the consumer goods and therefore the share of the established uh, license uh, uh, holders uh, declines very dramatically to you know 10% uh, uh, or below. Uh, so so that is the kind of history. Now what changes? What yeah. changes the, the regime? Why does it become uh, 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 so restrictive as we will discuss? I think you know we we will come to discuss in great detail. Uh, I think, you know, for particularly the younger generation, it is good to uh, follow how Kafkask or, or, or Valian this, this trade regime was uh, in those years. Yeah. So we, we can come to discuss that in detail. But very quickly, the origins of it. How, yeah. how did we end up with this kind of system? So what happened is that sterling balances were gradually uh, being uh, depleted. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, you knew that this was a fixed pot ultimately, which the British were releasing uh, 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 in, uh, in different tranches every year, uh, uh, but they were going to run out. Now, it also happens that BKNRU returns in 1954 and he's very upset that this foreign exchange budget is gone. Uh, and he also writes these uh, memos to the secretary at the time that look, you know, uh, and the minister, uh, Stevie Deshmukh, that look, you know, uh, 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 there is a problem here. Uh, yeah. He gets no replies. Uh, uh, so this is all from his autobiography, you know. So, so he gets no replies. Uh, uh, eventually, uh, uh, C.B. Deshmukh resigns. Uh, 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 T.T. Krishnamachari becomes a finance minister. Uh, yeah. uh, and uh, he promotes uh, B.K. Nehru to become the secretary of Department of Economic Affairs. And uh, around 19... 57, 58, that's the year in which Bikaneru is alarmed that, you know, uh, sterling balances. And if we look at the numbers, actually, you can see that in 1957, yeah. the foreign exchange reserve really declines quite dramatically. Uh, yeah. and, 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 and that uh, scares uh, him uh, as to what's to come. And so yeah. he quickly, on his own authority, as the secretary of DEA issues the order, for, for, uh, for uh, uh, the return of foreign exchange budgeting. Now, foreign exchange budgeting is nothing but the foreign exchange control. Yeah. It, 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 it simply says that, well, anybody who needs foreign exchange now, any transaction that yeah. will require foreign exchange, uh, they have to get the clearance uh, of some authority, which yeah. to begin with was, of course, nobody no other than Mr. B. Canero, that, that uh, so he would be begin to draw up this foreign exchange budget every six months. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, of course, you know, then we see that a whole kind of uh, uh, bureaucratic system yeah. uh, 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 has to be evolved because, you know, uh, it, it, there are lots of claimants of foreign exchange uh, mm -hmm. and, and how are you going to allocate them? How are you going to give them? Uh, also, this obviously also begins to lead to the tightening of the import licensing regime as well. And so yeah. we can sort of come to that. And the one thing I want to say here, one thing I want to say here, very, very important is that it was very unfortunate at this hour, at this time. There was no yeah. discussion. What were the possible solutions? You know, if some discussion had happened and if they had even considered the possibility of devaluation. Yeah. At this time, economy was doing well. Uh, you know, it, it was not you know, like growing uh, seven, eight, nine percent or anything, but you know, it was decent. Four percent growth had been achieved, which was uh, decent for the time. Uh, and the uh, food situation was uh, generally comfortable, uh, so inflation was not so completely out of hand. So generally, it was good economic conditions. If a proper devaluation had been done, we would have seen some response, some favorable response. You know, Manmohan Singh later, actually, when he writes his thesis in, in, in 1964. Uh, uh, that famous book, uh, India's Exports, uh, he actually read 
at the time does say that you know what we sh should do yeah. is to devalue. Uh, yeah. But you see, then the devaluation happens in June '66 when econo economic conditions are totally different. You know, there have yeah. been back back to droughts happen, and uh, uh, so so politically, you know, so it doesn't generate the kind of response that was required. But '57 '58, if they had devalued, uh, uh, history could be could have been a little different. Not dramatically yeah. different, I should say. Because still business of, you know, being in heavy industry being uh, uh, and consumer goods being done in cottage or hand industries, uh, that would have continued to haunt us nevertheless, you know, but still things could have been a little better. I completely agree with you. In fact, I wanted to delve into this 1958 as one of the, you know, important structural points in, in Indian economic history. In one sense, this is sort of the first post-independence balance of payments crisis that India is facing. Yeah. So almost on the brink. So, you know, that's part one. But I think what what is the the really important lesson? I mean, one, of course, I completely agree with you that, you know, in 1966, the economic situation was worse and also the egos were quite different. Uh, T.T. Krishnamachari just simply did not uh, get along well with the American administration at the time. And that led to, there was a lot of personal uh, conflict involved in that de devaluation not succeeding other than the economic problems at hand. In fact, we have a lovely timeline of why the 19, of what happened during the 1966 devaluation and, and why it failed in, in our 1991 project website. But you know, in 1958, had we devalued, none of the uh, control systems, whether it is, you know, talking about foreign exchange controls or talking about the later industrial licensing controls, which are a natural consequence of an autarchic system, none of that would have happened and therefore none of that would have had to be rolled back either. In a sense, the 1958 devaluation, had it happened, would have been a rather clean and simple affair, right? It, it's not, you know, having to roll out this massive, as you mentioned, Kafkaia system of controls and then having to roll all of it back as we started doing in 1991 and in some sense, we've still not managed to do. It would have been a shift in priorities. So, what happens in 1958, given that we don't devalue? One, one consequence is, is that the trade policies or trade priorities dramatically shift, right? And because the trade policy dramatically shifts, there is also a major shift in what is domestic production and consumption policy. Can you walk us through this? Like, what, what are these trade priorities and what are the adverse impacts that follow? Uh, you already hinted that, you know, there were outside economists like Bhagwati and Desai who eventually criticized the system that followed and, you know, even, even CN Vakil and Brahmananda. But, but what is the system conceptually post-58? Okay, so, so we come to that, but just, uh, you know, 58 itself, uh, uh, as I said, uh, probably dramatic uh, changes would not have happened as a result uh, because of the domestic regime being what it is, it was, unless, you know. But having said, said that, um, just imagine, you know, suppose it, the rupee was devalued significantly. I think it would have required significant devaluation. Yeah. Uh, if it was done, uh, uh, some export response would have happened. There is yeah. no doubt. Uh, it, it would have happened uh, because economy generally was otherwise on the upswing. So, so you would have got some export uh, response. That would have changed the minds a bit. Uh, you know, so what I'm saying is that one time devaluation probably would not have been enough to escape the kind of regime that eventually came to rule uh, on import protection. Uh, but if it would have also led to a more favorable view in the administration, in the government of devaluation that yes, devaluation is an instrument that can deliver exports uh, and therefore solve our foreign exchange problem. Then I think, you know, uh, a second time around, we would not have had the kind of episode you're describing <laughs> happened in 1966 yeah. that, you know, all the egos, et cetera, that come in because egos are building on some, uh, 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 you know, fears that everybody else is ex uh, expressing also that, you know, devaluation yeah. will be more uh, 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 inflationary and uh, it, it's, uh, you know, that whole elasticity pessimism that prevails and, and all. Uh, 
so, so it became a bit, you know, the failure of the success of devaluation became self-fulfilling. And that put yeah. God's fear in us to uh, devalue in the future, right? And so so uh, for a long time, till we come to 1980s, you know, seven, rupees 750 per dollar exchange rate remains. And remember yeah. that uh, in this uh, uh, intervening period, through these very high rates of inflation that we suffered from, uh, that of course continued to make the domestic products uh, less and less competitive. And so the exports continued to do poorly. So, so uh, uh, it is more the psychological impact, I think, you know, which, which might have helped uh, uh, if, if devaluation had been tried in 1958. Yeah. So anyway, so that doesn't, that's, that's not what happens at the end of the day. It's just yeah. one uh, 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 secretary's decision. Uh, 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 and nobody, suppose it, it seems, uh, 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 you know, you can't find very much uh, discussion of this anywhere, except in, uh, at least I have found it, uh, except in B. Kinaru's uh, uh, autobiography. Uh, he does that, and that's that. Uh, and that, of course, then now begins to build uh, this uh, uh, entire control regime. Now, remember that already investment licensing was, of course, being done. But 50s, you see, uh, 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 the, the 1950s, even investment licensing is relatively liberal because yeah. you don't, exp uh, uh, your foreign exchange situation is comfortable because the sterling balance is. So machinery, et cetera, that needs to be imported is, is can be can imported. Be and so it is not a big issue. So, so licenses were being issued. Only thing was that, you know, it was understood by the, the businessmen uh, and, the, and, the, and the industry in Bombay that uh, uh, consumer goods uh, uh, industry licenses will not be issued. So there's no point even for in applying. Yeah. So usually they knew the chemical industry, engineering industry, you will get the license. And so, uh, and so, you know, you don't see, you don't hear much complaints about the licensing system uh, uh, not working or uh, being clogged and so forth. That on only starts in the 1960s, uh, early to mid 1960s, and then a number of committees get appointed and all. But so what, what we can do uh, uh, here, uh, so, so by the way, you know, uh, uh, also, uh, the 1980, 1950s, nobody is paying attention to exports. So that we will discuss yeah. later on when we come to the export policy. But uh, 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 basic point to note here currently at, at the present moment is that uh, uh, because sterling balances have run out, uh, because exports are not doing well, and nobody is paying attention, you know, there is practically, uh, 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 it's, it, it's, it's a policy of benign neglect on the export front. Uh, yeah. And, and we also suffer, right? You know, in an obscure place, you know, Vakil and Ramanan say this. They say that, look, don't let go of these consumer goods industries in which we have actually developed yeah. expertise over four to five decades. We have the expertise and they could serve as export industries. So they in fact make that pitch in their paper, which was submitted to the planning commission as a part of the uh, panel of economists uh, 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 discussions, uh, 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 but uh, I don't think anybody paid attention to it. Uh, but yeah. but they they said that look, you know, but if and then if you look at the industrial structure, uh, how it evolved, uh, then apparently you see this that you know, like cotton textiles, uh, uh, they, they there is hardly any expansion that happens. Uh, you know, between uh, the 1955, 56, and 60, 61, five-year period, the index of, in, uh, of cotton textiles production uh, uh, rises from 128 to 133. Not, you know, it's just a less than 4% increase. Compared to that, if you look at the general industrial index, that rose from 139 to 194. So that's about, you know, almost 40% increase. So whereas... So it's the industries that are expanding, allow, being allowed to expand are things like iron and steel, machinery, chemicals. These are the industries that are flourishing, uh, flourishing by you know, the standards of the day. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, but cotton textiles, it, it's not allowed to you know, expand. And this yeah. is where we have the advantage. They could turn into export industries, revenues would have been coming, but no, it was not allowed. And, and it's a pity in a way because, you know, India had a very large share, you know, 10 to 11 percent in exports of cotton textiles uh, around this time in the 1950s. Uh, that advantage is allowed to wither away. Uh, yeah. And then 
alternative industries, you know, they try to get machine, you know, engineering goods and chemicals to become exporters. Some exports emerge, but you know, these are small. That's also happens, begins to happen in 1960s, not, not in the 50s. So 50s, our big exports are like jute textiles, tea, um, uh, you know, what you'll call primary products. And at yeah. that time we are actually, you know, either imposing export restrictions, meaning quantitative yeah. restrictions, no more than this, or we are even taxing in some cases, export taxes are being levied. Mm -hmm. So there's no, you know, desire, it is also skepticism that, you know, uh, 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 that, you know, uh, they, uh, trying to export more of it will result in decline in prices. Uh, also shared by the economists, you know, this elasticity pessimism that existed at the time and all. Uh, uh, so, so on the one hand, you let, you know, where elasticity was high, uh, both price elasticity yeah. as well as the income elasticity was high, which is cotton textiles. There we let it kind of uh, uh, yeah. uh, 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 decline for totally wrong reasons, meaning, you know, we yeah. are trying to do only heavy industry. Uh, so the capital has to be saved for the heavy industry. So cotton textile gets uh, neglected. Uh, and where we were exporting, rather than still try to develop those industries, we let them decline also through these uh, controls on exports and, and, and uh, uh, export taxes. So overall situation of the foreign exchange is bad and that's why mm -hmm. the crisis and so forth. So now of course uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the import policy, how it looks, right? You know, before the import policy, to me, it seems like whatever we see later, you know, at an economy wide scale in India, which is the problem of command and control policies, we see it as a microcosm with foreign exchange budgeting under BK Nehru, right? The, it, the same kind of adverse consequences. So what you basically have is you have a bureaucrat who's in control of all the resources. And the, it's the job of the bureaucrat to pick winners and losers as opposed to the market, you know, the discipline of a competitive market picking winners and losers. And the bureaucrat has already decided that the winner is heavy industry, right? And it's not going to be some of the consumer goods like garments and textiles that, you know, that you were talking about. And now you almost have a self-fulfilling prophecy because all the capital is only going to go to heavy industry you further have a situation where all these consumer good manufacturers no longer get the kind of investment they need and they're going to be less competitive, which means they're going to export less, which means you're going to earn less foreign exchange, which means that the demands of the bureaucrat who's controlling foreign exchange in the first place become worse. And now you do this over three or four or five cycles and you end up in a very dire situation by, you know, let's say the mid 1960s. Is that a good way of thinking about what happened post foreign exchange budgeting? Oh, I think so. Uh, uh, absolutely. I mean, it's very interesting. Uh, uh, there, is a, there is a quote somewhere in B.K. Nehru's uh, uh, autobiography, uh, you, you, I mean, because you mentioned the fact of the bureaucrat making the decision. At that time, he was a junior, you know, the first time when he did this in 1948, I think, you know, he doesn't mention the date exactly, so one has to guess a little bit. But my, uh, from reading in between lines, probably was around 1948 or maybe 47. Uh, so he was the junior most joint secretary in, in the ministry. <laughs> and, and he issues the order that uh, 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 henceforth, and then very triumphantly writes, you know, in his autobiography saying that now, you know, uh, 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 every ministry had to come to the junior most uh, uh, joint secretary, Mr. B. K. Nehru, uh, to get the clearance. Uh, and, and, and Mr. B. K. Nehru had the power to now uh, cut uh, uh, anybody's foreign exchange demands uh, uh, to whatever he thought was appropriate. So, <laughs> I mean, but that, that, of course, as I said, you know, was, was gutted after he left, returned back yeah. to the, uh, he went to IMF as executive director. But then when he came back, you know, so it came back, but, but it was very much of a bureaucratic decision. It was very much yeah. of a bureaucratic decision. So as you say, India has, in a sense, doubled down on its heavy industry policy. It has doubled down on, you know, disincentivizing small industries or, you know, hand industries and, and so on and so forth. Uh, but it has also doubled down on the role of the 
the bureaucrat as the center for or you know sort of as the coordinating node for all economic activity in the country right so these three things these were bets that were made by nehru in the late 40s and by the late 50s we've doubled down on all three bets even though you know at the end of the second plan there is some minor criticism about what's happening now how does this play out exactly in terms of um, you know the import an export system and in particular i want to talk about the controls and tariff system you know uh, from yes. what i understand tariffs even at this point in time played a fairly small part in india straight policy india straight policy was really about import and export controls at that time so can you walk us through this because this is an area not too many people are familiar with and it's a little bit extraordinary once we hear about just how deep the control system went uh, i mean there, there's nothing like this that exists in india today even though we are still a relatively you know restrictive trade regime uh, but this is just something that you read in sci-fi novels or something like that <laughs> yeah so so i think you know even though it's a bit tedious discussion i think we have to look at it in in some detail because yes. you know today uh, there are very often there are casual kind of remarks get made that oh we are returning to 1970s no no we are not returning to 1970s <laughs> you know because <laughs> anybody who makes that remarks just doesn't know what 1970s and 60s were yeah. <laughs> i mean so 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 it, it is worthwhile from that perspective to to you know flesh it out a bit you know yeah so as you said tariffs yes you know uh, uh, tariffs were not used as the protective instrument nor they were used in a serious way you know as revenue instruments because yeah. uh, 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 either way you would have actually uh, you know tried to take out all the quota rents that got created you know licenses yeah. created a lot of premium on uh, you know uh, on yeah. the imported products uh, they they did not you know so on average tariffs you know uh, uh, like uh, uh, the highest tariff uh, around like, this is 1965 66 we have the data uh, from bhagwati and desai yeah. uh, and uh, you know consumer goods were the highest which is 100% but anyway yeah. that didn't matter much because licenses were, were so tough uh, to get for consumer goods basically by 65 66 you know uh, uh, except for rare commodities you would not get you know so these were not even permissible commodities they were yeah. permissible commodities and they were non permissible commodities and consumer goods largely largely were non permissible plant and machinery 35% agricultural machinery 15% uh, yeah. basic industrial raw material 40% so you know they, they were not uh, uh, particularly high uh, um, uh, collection wise also if you look at you know 62 63 you were Uh, 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 import revenues, tariff revenues as a percent of yeah. the uh, dutiable goods. So it's not yeah. even of all as a percentage of all imports, but only goods that were subject to positive duty. Twenty five yeah. or twenty six percent in sixty two, sixty three. It rises uh, steadily to about six fifty five percent by sixty five, sixty six. But this is really nothing compared to what we would call the import premium. now you know i'll give you some examples so you'll have a good laugh at uh, at some of these numbers uh, so so on some consumer goods for example bhagwati and desai really very good documentation by the way anybody who is interested should really read that book it's a yeah. hard book absolutely. to read but 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 it's 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 absolutely a gold mine of information uh, uh, yeah. on entire indian i mean it's not just trade policy you know trade policy is fleshed out in detail also but also industrial policy politics private versus public sector everything you know it's, it's a fantastic book uh, uh, you know uh, uh, anybody interested in that part of the history really should read that book uh, 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 absolute landmark so here some numbers pens you know pens were uh, 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 not generally not allowed to be imported uh, so mm -hmm. it was very difficult you know so so uh, they, they, so they provide for three different kinds of pens you know there is goldwig waverly and hindu uh, uh h i n d o o so yeah. on gold wing the so so this is the premium over the world price so yeah. border price cif delivered price so you, what you are looking at is what is the domestic price minus yeah. the cif price uh, uh, from uh, imported uh, as a percentage of the cif price so yeah. so how 
by what percent the domestic price exceeds the CIF import price. Yeah. For Goldwing, three hundred eighty percent. For Beverly, two hundred ninety one percent. So, you know, uh, there are pencils, right? I mean, you think lead pencils. So Taj Mahal lead pencil was the desired commodity in those days because the premium <laughs> on that was six hundred two percent. Six hundred two. You got you know writing paper. So there is some conqueror writing paper. Six hundred ten percent premium on it. So it's really wow. you know, and these are the, uh, uh, the 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 more kind of final products. But then there are also in, on intermediate inputs. Intermediate. Uh, yeah, massive. You know, so the engineering goes like shock absorb, uh, shock absorbers for Jeep. So in fact, in this case, the numbers are giving you. Uh, um, uh, the uh, 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 the percentage by which the domestic price exceeded the tariff inclusive price. Okay, so in this yeah. case, tariff inclusive. So it, even that's taken out, and on top of the tariff, uh, this is the amount of uh, profit you can make, proportionate tariff you can make if you got the license. Yeah. So uh, shock absorbers for Jeep, 146 percent. This is 1962. Shock yeah. absorbers, Landmaster, 150 percent. So you know this is uh, 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 incredibly high premiums that that are there, and that's because yeah. tariff policy is not what is determining what your domestic price is. It yeah. is the import restriction, which is so tight, uh, and the demand and the need for it is so intense. Yeah, that uh, people are willing to pay that kind of price. Yeah, so, you know, so, so one of really the things the, is also uh, paper. Uh, in your list, right? It's uh, if I can find printing paper Solex, which is uh, the the amount. The premium is two hundred and sixty five, and it reminds me of the uh, you know anecdote you told me about Bhagwati writing to his friends abroad. <laughs> That's true. That is a good one. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe you can tell us that anecdote again. <laughs> yeah. So 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 obviously you know the, the, this paper being so expensive, everybody would use the the Indian paper, right? Yeah. So, so, so Bhagwati sort of came from uh, Cambridge, where uh, 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 and and was very nationalist at the time. Uh, the whole family was, you know, I mean, uh, yeah. I think uh, 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 apparently one of his brothers was also uh, participant participant in the underground movement and all at the time. Uh, so, uh, uh, so, 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 so he like you know to his teacher Harry Johnson. Who is a yeah. trade economist and uh, uh, of, of great repute, actually. He died relatively young, you know, so yeah. uh, somewhere around 76, 77. So he would have certainly been uh, uh, probably Jagdish and uh, Johnson would have been jointly awarded a Nobel Prize uh, if, if he had been alive. Uh, but anyway, so, so Jagdish wrote to him saying that, you know, uh, dear Harry, uh, I, I find uh, it so uh, repulsive or something, yeah, not quite those words, but you know that, that it, it's really disappointing that uh, there is such a craze for foreign goods uh, in India. Uh, so, so Harry being also a very quick wit, uh, wrote, wrote back saying that, you know, dear Jagdish, if uh, uh, I go by the uh, quality of the paper on which your letter was written, uh, the craze for the foreign goods seems quite justified to me. And, you know, just to connect it back to some of the previous, you know, discussions we've had in the last uh, three episodes, uh, this is classic, right? There is this huge premium for imported goods, uh, which means there's this huge demand. And you basically, you have this huge demand because you want to make sure that the goods are not imported and some domestic substitute is used. But because there is such a big premium, the domestic competitors don't have to really compete, which means that their product quality ends up being relatively low. They're not competing with the best uh, paper abroad or the best, you know, pens abroad or any of the, you know, shock absorbers, any of the examples that you gave. And uh, that bears out perfectly in this, you know, lovely anecdote of letters between two trade economists, which is Absolutely. everything we've learned about trade. Uh, it's in this one table in Bhagwati and Desai, right? There is this yeah, premium absolutely. on paper, yeah. and now, now this is where we're going. Uh, yeah, but no, and uh, you'll see, you know, as we as we go. Uh, uh, obviously, when you say that you know they are not competing with the best in the world, they don't need to. Because they don't need to. It doesn't matter that the, the way the import regime is going to evolve now or has evolved by mid mid nineteen sixties. 
uh, is that uh, 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 if anything is produced at home, yeah. whatever the quality of it doesn't matter, whatever the price at which you are going to get it doesn't matter, yeah. protection will be provided. Imports will yeah. automatically, you know, if you say that I'm going to produce something, imports will not be permitted anyway of it. So, so, the, so they didn't have to compete. Absolutely. Yeah. So anyway, so, so what, what, we, what we can do is uh, uh, for the listeners, you know, try to walk through what exactly yeah. this, uh, this import system, uh, system looks is, like. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, uh, all right. Uh, now here, uh, the, the, uh, 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 there are two parallel bureaucracies at work. Uh, one bureaucracy has to take care of the foreign exchange issue, right? That uh, 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 how the foreign exchange is going to be allocated. So, so there has to be a bureaucracy to do that. In parallel, there is another bureaucracy which has to make decisions on what goods will be allowed to be imported. Yeah. And so import licensing authority. So, so there is an import licensing bureaucracy and there is a foreign exchange bureaucracy. And at some point, of course, the two have to come together. Yeah. Uh, but what, what, what the two bureaucracies mean is that your first job, if you, are an, if you want to import something, your first job is to get an import license. And then you have to get the foreign exchange. Yeah. Uh, so uh, getting the import license is necessary, but not a sufficient condition that you'll be eventually able to import. Because, yeah. or when you will be able to import. Uh, so, yeah. so, so ultimately for an exchange will have to become available as well. Yeah. Uh, so you may have to wait a little longer. So that's the first broad point that there are these two bureaucracies uh, with which you have to deal. So first of all, uh, there were three main kind of authorities uh, uh, that had the uh, power to issue licenses. Uh, uh, these were not overlapping. These were chartered. These, these were farmed out. That uh, so most of the licenses were issued by the chief controller of imports and exports. So there was a chief controller of imports and exports who issued most of the licenses, most of the import licenses, except the ones that are issued by the other two authorities. So the who were the two other authorities? The iron and steel controller. So yeah. you can see heavy industry and steel, Nehru's very yeah. kind of favorite <laughs> industry, yeah. uh, that was uh, uh, always uh, 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 supreme. So, yeah. so you had a separate iron and steel controller. Uh, so any licenses that had to do with the imports of iron and steel, iron and steel controller would issue those licenses. So you yeah. to deal with that. Then there was a third one, which is the development officer tools. So th this is where some technical stuff goes on uh, uh, within the development wing of the Ministry of Commerce. Yeah. So, so anything that had to do with technical stuff, then uh, uh, the development officer. And, and so what licenses that uh, uh, authority, the development officer in Commerce Ministry issued was also stated that this is their territory. Right? So uh, that was the uh, the, the division. So, so the yeah. most of the licenses, therefore, were issued by the uh, by the uh, uh, the, the um, uh, chief controller of imports and exports, uh, and and known by the acronym uh, uh, CCI and E. I mean, in those days, you know, you, you never uh, use the full form, you know, chief controller or something. Yeah. <laughs> say CC and I, CCI and E, CCI and E. Um, okay, now. What were the import licenses themselves were like? So there is yeah. a whole classification of different import licenses. Uh, yeah. And these are terms we have already discussed earlier. Uh, so there were the established importers. These were the importers who could import and then sell it to others. Yeah. Uh, 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 as opposed to the next category, which was actual users. Yeah. So actual users license were issued only to the actual users, as it's yeah. what it says. Uh, so these are largely for raw material and uh, uh, you know, intermediate inputs. Yeah. So all the inputs that have to be imported uh, would be uh, go as actual users. 
uh, and then there is established importers. Then they had a separate category called capital goods. So any capital goods to be imported, which were also usually issued only to the actual users, no established yeah. importer will get a, a license yeah. to that. Um, so that was another very important category. So if you are starting a new enterprise, so and obviously there is an interface there with the industrial licensing authority, ultimately, yeah. because the industrial licensing authority will not give you the industrial license unless you had the clearance first uh, from the capital goods committee uh, uh, of the CCI and E. So, so that's how it worked for the, uh, the, the industrial licensing was connected also to this import licensing. Yeah. You know, it's not just the import licensing and uh, for an exchange authority, but, but also there's a link to the, to the industrial uh, uh, licenses. Then there were some others like, you know, heavy electrical plant had a separate category for itself. These are, you know, uh, 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 electricity generation uh, plants, yeah. if you are going to, uh, going to bring in. Uh, and there were uh, uh, license for newcomers, established versus newcomers. So it's, I don't think there were many in those days, you know, uh, uh, but, but if somebody found a way, you know, some connection or what have you, and then under newcomers, you, you, you would be also, there's a newcomers license. Uh, then there was some export promotion. Uh, this was also done, particularly in the 60s, they had started off. So there was some export promotion licenses as well. Uh, and then there were some miscellaneous categories and all. But, but really the main ones uh, is, is actual user for inputs yeah. and capital goods for uh, capital machinery. So those were the licenses to be issued. Now, how the system worked uh, 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 was that you know what what we can do basically uh, uh, the the Bhagwatian Desai kind of give the illustration that uh, if you look at uh, you know how the actual user licenses were uh, issued um, uh, 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 for these inputs that's the illustration they gave you so the first the importer had to meet two basic conditions so if you are an importer first thing you need to do is get clearances for two conditions. One is essentiality that we have yeah. already seen before that was introduced in the Second World War, uh, yeah. but now it becomes very critical. Now the yeah. implication of essentiality condition is simply that you know that uh, uh, it gives bureaucrats some power, right? You know, uh, if if the if if the bureaucrat decides that this is not an essential import for whatever not. reason, then you are done for. So so it, it does give you. Then the second condition that had to be offered, even if it was essential. Uh, it was also had to be something that was domestically not available. So there was a domestic non-availability condition. Yeah. Uh, and that condition was regardless of cost or quality. It doesn't yeah. matter how much it is going to cost to get from domestic source. It doesn't matter what quality product you are going to get. Uh, uh, so much so that I remember, you know, and Kruger has this example one time, you know, uh, uh, for India's tea exports were suffering to Germany and they were suffering, they were losing out to the competitors because the, uh, 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 you know, tea bags, yeah. they had to use local paper, they had to use local paper and that quality of the paper was so poor that their exports were getting rejected. But the government of India would not uh, allow the, uh, <laughs> the, because they were domestically available, so you okay. failed the condition of domestic non-availability. So anybody who comes in and says, yeah, I can provide it. Uh, doesn't matter how uh, good or how bad, you know, the quality didn't matter, price didn't matter. Uh, so you could easily also be driven. Uh, I mean, so for both reasons, you could be driven out of your uh, export markets, right? You know, yeah. if the quality is poor, you will get driven out. If uh, uh, price is, if the cost is very high domestically, then also you will be driven out. But yeah. that was a condition. So then, who was the authority to give these uh, certifications? So that's where there is a sponsoring agency that comes into play. Uh, you had to have some, so they, they'll be designated for different uh, sector uh, imports. There'll be different uh, ministries, you know, uh, or different directorates who would be authorized to be the sponsoring agencies who would normally give the uh, essentiality certification. Uh, and many times this sponsoring authority will also give the, domestic non-availability certification, although the two agencies were not always the same, you know, yeah. for sometimes your 
uh, essentiality uh, uh, certification may be from one authority and uh, uh, your non-availability may come from another authority. But, but they, these are designated, so you have to go and get those. Now, actual user licenses for input imports, uh, uh, how did it work? So now the CCI and E, uh, um, the, uh, 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 it, it, this uh, so 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 th there is you know uh, um, uh, these are divided actually user licenses themselves then get divided into several groups yeah okay? so for example they get uh, divided into small scale sector so yeah. there is some licenses which are in the small scale sector actual user then there is second which is organized sector scheduled industries that are assigned to the Directorate General of Technical Development in the Ministry yeah. of Commerce. Yeah. So there are some in industries for, so, so there is small scale sector, then the large scale yeah. sector is divided into two. Yeah. One is the set of industries, and these are more kind of technically sophisticated industries, uh, yeah. uh, for, uh, which are, uh, for which you have the Directorate, uh, you know, organized sector scheduled industries assigned to the Directorate General of Technical Development. Uh, uh, and then you got the other organized uh, uh, sector schedule industries or whatever you call the other large scale uh, industries, right? So small and then large, large divided into, into uh, these two. So the Directorate General of Technical Development certified the importer for both essentiality and domestic non-availability condition for industries that were assigned to that. So that Directorate was assigned a number of industries and they would give both the essentiality, uh, essentiality certification and non-availability certification. Yeah. For a uh, uh, small scale, they were the state directors of industries okay. who gave the same clearances for small scale uh, uh, importers, uh, uh, entrepreneurs. And then for remaining scheduled industries, there were a number of different agencies, depending on the type of import. Right, yeah. so you you had the there was a central silk board that will certify the essentiality and non-availability for the silk industry. There was coal commissioner who would do it for collieries. Yeah. Uh, there was textile commissioner who would do for textiles. Yeah. So like that. So there were these yeah. different designated agencies. But you know, so this is a the, natural consequence of what the the original problem, right? So if you don't have a tariff system and you instead opt for a control system, you know, as part of your trade policy, then, you know, you say, okay, now we need some kind of rational mechanism by which we can allocate, right? Which is not the market rational mechanism. We need to substitute it with something. And then they come up with this essentiality and non-availability. But both essentiality and non-availability completely depend on the sector in question right and now you've created a situation where you need about seven different bureaucracies the ones that you've mentioned because a random person sitting in commerce ministry may not know much about silk or textile or tea or you know the the uh, dgtd which you know was for you know chemical fertilizer or something like that which means now you need to house these new bureaucracies you need to hire chemical engineers who will become engineers turned bureaucrat who then have to, you know, go through a particular protocol and say this is essential or not, or this can be produced at home or not. So the whole system in a way creates itself, right? It's not like someone messed up and, and made a hack job of it. It's if you start with import controls, this is the only logical place you will end up and there's nowhere else to go, you know, really. Yeah. In fact, I'm surprised yeah. it was this limited. I would have imagined even further proliferation, which probably happens, you know, would have happened oh, if no, we had no. gone past. Yeah, no, no, don't, don't underestimate here, you know, the, uh, <laughs> by, by the list here, because uh, list is partial, uh, yeah. uh, right? Because, you know, the, all the ministries will chip in and later on as it evolves, yeah. there were groups of ministers created. And yeah. uh, 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 by the way, uh, 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 I don't think they're hiring engineers to do this, uh, <laughs> you know, except maybe in DGTD, maybe, you know, there was yeah. some, but, but largely these are operations run by the IAS bureaucrats because yeah. remember that there are big... Uh, uh, rents, rents associated with these decisions. They're big rents yeah. associated, you know. So, yeah. so we are at every single point, 
you are creating yeah. uh, rents and therefore uh, potential for uh, uh, bribes. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, 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 you know, uh, uh, this is why also the files, the movement of files, right? You know, that file yeah. begins with the lowest level officer within any ministry yeah. for anything. Uh, so the essentiality or uh, uh, non-availability and all, you know, I will start at the bottom and yeah. un until you put some weight on the file, you know, you have to put some weight on the file before it moves. Absolutely. <laughs> so, meaning, yeah. you know, no. so, so you have to bribe the fellow. You have to no, bribe absolutely. the fellow to the, uh, often, you know, so. And, you know, I remember so, T.N. Srinivasan had said somewhere that you have all these different controls, right? You have capital controls and you have import uh, controls. You have, you know, industrial licensing controls and price and quantity controls. And then he said all the controls taken together were far more restrictive than each of them individually, right? So, course, for instance, yeah. if you get the industrial license it doesn't automatically imply that you have a capital goods import license. Then you have to go yeah. and stand in front of a different bureaucracy altogether. And it's only when you get all the licenses, can you even start? That's the starting point for production for a domestic entrepreneur, right? Uh, yeah. So there is something really quite crazy going on in the way the Indian economy started running you know where starting in the yeah. 60s and then goes yeah, on for a yeah. fair period. yeah not only multiple points but they also interact you see because uh, they interact. once foreign exchange became became limited then uh, uh, if you needed a machinery for example uh, previously in the 1950s it was enough to to give the broad category within which the machinery import would fall meaning yeah. broad category of the industrial classification. Yeah. But now, now, you know, once this happened, you have to give a very detailed uh, 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 description of the machinery, uh, yeah. of your raw materials, everything. They had to be very specific, very detailed uh, description uh, uh, because uh, uh, it, it had to be then assessed by the uh, uh, essentiality authority exactly that that you know otherwise it's a, how do you even uh, assess uh, uh, so you so you have to give very detailed specifications so even that that sort of thing you know um, uh, 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 crept in so so yes uh, it, it, it the, the 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 sum of the, the the restrictions actually amount to hell of a lot more than the individual restrictions uh, taken in isolation absolutely yeah um, and yeah now so, this licensing you know, this is just the import licensing part of the story, right? But there is also right. an entire system of uh, controls related to foreign exchange, uh, for Absolutely. instance. Yeah, right, right. So then, then there is a separate separate uh, bureaucracy <laughs> that runs uh, on, on how the foreign exchange is to be allocated. So that starts with the... Uh, with the uh, there, there was uh, uh, eventually they created by 1965. It existed already. Uh, uh, it, it started at the top with the foreign exchange budget branch in the DEA, Department of Economic Affairs and Finance Ministry. So they had a whole separate uh, foreign exchange budget branch. Uh, and so what they would do is first they will estimate uh, uh, what uh, the foreign exchange uh, availability from exports and other sources is going to be over the next six months or a year. Uh, so there were periods, you know, when they were doing, uh, so there used to be something called the Red Book uh, that came out of uh, the, the Commerce Ministry uh, every six months or sometimes every year. Uh, and, and the Red Book spelled out in great detail, you know, uh, uh, what is allowed, what's disallowed, what is permissible, what's not permissible, in what quantity, from where. It, 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 it is an incredible uh, documentation, you know, so... So, so that's that's how it it, it it started there. So what happened then? Uh, uh, first, they, what they would do is there were some priority items which uh, they would take out at the source uh, uh, within the finance ministry itself. So any debt yes. service charges, debt payment, uh, that uh, it, uh, any interest and principal that had to be paid back on uh, India's foreign debt that was uh, deducted first. Embassy expenditures got deducted first. Uh, anything that's related to food, fertilizer, and uh, yeah. uh, petroleum, oil, and lubricants, POL. Uh, defense expenditures that also got taken out. Uh, so all this taken out, then what is left over is what is available for the allocation, allocation. to other importers. So now we come to the foreign exchange. 
which is now to be divided. Uh, so there is, we start with three categories here, uh, which is at the level of the finance ministry, the DEA, uh, this so-called uh, foreign exchange budget branch of the DEA. So there will be one allocation or a number of allocations for public sector undertakings. Yeah. Right. So what would happen is that the ministry itself, finance ministry itself, DEA, would allocate uh, 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 each public sector undertaking certain amount of uh, foreign exchange, uh, both for inputs and for uh, capital uh, uh, imports. So these are for public sector undertakings or public sector enterprises. And it will then assign that foreign exchange to the ministry that is relevant. So you know, if the uh, particular enterprise belongs to heavy industries, it will go to heavy industries. Uh, yeah. If it belongs to textile ministry, then it goes to textile ministry, like that. So that's the allocation, uh, you know. Now it's up to the ministry how it, because remember now the allocation problem, uh, uh, both for license as well as, uh, 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 as, well as uh, for, uh, for an exchange, particularly for an exchange, uh, is not just at the level of the industry. Then it has to be to the level of the enterprise. Which yeah. enterprises are going to get, uh, which enterprises are not going to get. So there is also that allocation which we have to deal with. So now, uh, 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 first off, the public sector enterprises, they for them goes to their relevant ministry for an exchange allocation is communicated. Then there is a bulk allocation for inputs and capital goods uh, that uh, uh, went to the iron and steel controller. Uh, yeah. That is the, you know, uh, uh, favored child uh, of, of, of the uh, <laughs> government of the day. Uh, and so there is iron and steel controller. Uh, so remember that iron and steel controller also issues the licenses. So in this case, the foreign exchange decision as well as licensing decision, and also the essentiality and, uh, and, and the uh, uh, non-availability condition issuance, all that is in, in, in this uh, iron and steel controller. And the remainder of the foreign exchange was allocated to the economic advisor in the Ministry of Commerce. Uh, yeah. And largely this was uh, for the private sector uh, enterprises who wanted to import inputs or machinery. Right? So, so for the bulk actually, uh, you know, once you took out the public sector enterprises, you took out iron steel, uh, the bulk of the remaining foreign exchange now is about for the private sector people and that authority uh, that at least the allocation is now sent out to the economic advisor in the Ministry of Commerce. And now it's okay. up to the Ministry of Commerce advisor, economic advisor uh, in the Ministry of Commerce, who has to figure out the allocation across industries first, and then from yeah. industries, it has to be figured out to the individual enterprises. Yeah. So you can see it's not a simple bureaucracy, you know. No. It is a, uh, and, and we'll, we'll uh, uh, I'll give you some numbers. You'll find, you know, uh, uh, it's mind-boggling actually uh, once you begin to see uh, uh, what you know the numbers that are involved here. So each of these entities then got their allocation of foreign exchange. They had to, as I said, divide among the in industries and enterprises. Now. Uh, uh, how did the economic advisor allocate? Now, economic advisor created a lot of the groups uh, of, of uh, entities to which it will then allocate the foreign exchange, right? So there were some groups created by commodities. So examples, Bhagwati and Desai gave like copra and caustic soda. These are like commodities, commodity groups. Yeah. Then there were uh, groups of industries uh, such as the uh, such as bulk allocations to Directorate General of Technical Development. Remember, DGTD yeah. is the authority yeah. for many organized sector industries to issue the essentiality and non-availability uh, yeah. uh, uh, certification. So, for that group of industries, the Economic Advisor Ministry of Commerce will make an allocation to the DGTD, the same same authority. Right. So. Uh, for a lot of these industries, uh, 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 you know, iron and steel had its own for both uh, uh, licenses as well as uh, uh, for an exchange allocation. Likewise, DGTD had the jurisdiction uh, over both functions so in, a, in a large number of industries, uh, particularly the chemical and engineering industries. Then uh, uh, by size of enterprises, 
the advisor will make another allocation, meaning small scale. So for small scale sector, another bulk allocation gets made. Yeah. Then there were schemes such as export promotion schemes under which exporters were given entitlement to import license, some entitlement to import uh, 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 under some license, under an, under an entitlement license. Uh, so for that, there is a separate allocation made. So these different categories uh, 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 are, are identified by the economic advisor and there is this allocation done of the bulk allocation that the advisor receives, right? And, and now it has to be then further at the enterprise level, uh, there has yeah. to be separate allocation, right? And the advisor also has to decide about how much to allocate for the input guys, raw materials yeah. and uh, um, intermediate inputs, how much to, for the capital goods, right? So th that allocation has to be done. In most of these cases, there were different administrative agencies such as the DDTD, textiles commissioner, uh, Etc. involved, uh, and uh, it was not unusual for an enterprise uh, to get foreign exchange from multiple agencies. Right. Yeah. So if you need steel, if you need steel, then it's the steel uh, uh, iron and steel controller. Yeah. If you need non-ferrous metals, right? If there are non-ferrous metals, you have to go to another agency. If you need capital goods imports you have to deal with another agency. So yeah. any importer in principle would be dealing with multiple uh, Absolutely. sources of uh, foreign exchange. You know, it's not like, yeah. you know, well, this is my total need and, you know, this is what, uh, no, you have to have separate applications made for every one of these uh, separate category of imports. So, so it was really kind of a uh, uh, very, very uh, elaborate uh, system. Mm -hmm. But this is just a process, right? It's just a process. Yeah. Now comes the question. And now comes the question, how do you allocate? Right? How yeah. do you allocate? <laughs> and, and, you know, the question is not just how do you allocate, right? It can't just be any random allocation. It is, <laughs> is this allocation rational? And what we mean by that is, is it the best use of scarce resources, right? Are resources going to their highest valued use within this system, the way they would have done in a competitive market process, right? So there is a standard for comparison. So we're not just saying, oh, you have 100 rupees, and let's make sure that the different sectors are all happy with like a small share of the 100 rupees. The, the claim in the socialist system and this autarchic system is that it is an improvement upon the market system, right? And that is something we mustn't forget at the back of our mind, right? So the job of is course. not just... Yeah, it's not just that it has to be done, that they, the claim is that it's done better. But, you know, I want to go back to an earlier point that you mentioned, and I have a personal anecdote here, uh, where you said that, you know, at that time, journalists and public intellectuals and everyone was socialist and there was no real criticism coming from any quarter. And uh, my, my grandfather and his younger brother, my great uncle, both were journalists. And by great uncle in particular, you know, at that time, for a long time, he was with Hindustan Times and then with the Hindu, he was based in uh, New Delhi. And he's told me so many stories of how newspaper, like national newspapers, right? So we're talking about Hindustan Times or the Hindu or these really big papers. You have to go and stand in Commerce Ministry or Iron and Steel or any one of the departments that you're talking about to get allocation for a printing machine right? To get foreign exchange yeah. allocation for newsprint. And of course, we know the newsprint orders were used in a particularly, you know, malevolent way by Mrs. Gandhi. And then, you know, it went on to the Bennett Coleman case. And then the Supreme Court said, this is an actual infringement, you know, the newsprint order, which is essentially an, an import allocation <laughs> policy, right? It's a trade policy question, uh, said that it's an infringement on free speech, uh, you know, in that particular Supreme Court case. But you have a situation where if you need, you know, RK Lakshman has written in his biography that if you needed to make a trip abroad as a, as a journalist, you needed to get, you know, your allocation of dollars. <laughs> and how do you get that? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
every single so when we when we're thinking about this and you know we say iron and steel or we say paper or we say coal our natural tendency is to only think about a particular type of industry and we're thinking about you know like this rich greedy capitalist standing in front of a really malevolent bureaucrat but in fact it seeps into everything right it seeps into schools it seeps into hospitals it seeps into newspapers and before you know it especially in the case of newspapers and schools you can't have any opposition to the the current dispensation and its economic regime because you are all waiting in line to get your allocation which can be taken away at any point you know by one arbitrary move uh, of someone saying this absolutely. is doesn't fulfill essentiality or something like that no no absolutely it's a perfect system for uh, uh, extracting bribes abuse absolutely yeah, yeah. yeah. abuse and extracting bribes you know and the pity is that the cake is so small so you know bribes yeah. that are being extracted are also small uh, <laughs> you know sometimes uh, all you are doing is to treat the fellow to, uh, to a cup of tea or something you know <laughs> or samosa maybe <laughs> but yeah so uh, you know because because the incomes are so low uh, i mean i remember yeah. you know when we were growing up we would complain that oh such and such you know he's an irrigation engineer and he's such a corrupt fellow and all but then when we grew up we found out that nobody you know became rich uh, taking yeah. bribes uh, yeah. because ultimately ultimately it was a, a, a cake was so small so yeah. you know if you and it was more a, a favor part, and you know it was more like a favor exchange system right so you would uh, also, you know bribe the bribe for the bureaucrat was that uh, the son in law will be given a job in the in the company that you know was requesting the foreign exchange or something like that right I, it really became a favor and crony economy uh, you know in addition to a corrupt and discretionary economy uh, it really started enforcing these networks of you know you need to know who is who and that's how you get things done so you know even when yeah. you look at all these old 1970s movies right like these amol palekar movies and all it, it keeps popping up how you can't get a job without sifarish right without without someone yeah, calling yeah, from course. above yeah, yeah, yeah. right so it really became like this favor exchange economy in a in a really strange uh, so it has implications even for human capital allocation right you you mess with this yeah, trade and capital control system and eventually all the downstream effects are that that it infects everything so just you know to to take this further uh you know in addition to what you said bhagwati and uh, desai there's uh, of course arun shori's excellent work his doctoral dissertation on this kind of foreign exchange allocation it's very uh, readable but what are the economic effects you know like beyond this corrupt immediate corrupt political economy that has been created for foreign exchange right right so so let's come to the effects but first you know uh, th just the basic idea to just to complete our discussion of of how difficult the system was and and the the whole idea that ultimately all right so this was the process but how was the process implemented what were the priorities you know precisely yeah. how did the bureaucrats decide so on that pragati and desai write this you know beautiful sentence they say that look you know this was a, the problem was orwellian all industries had priority and how was each sponsoring authority to argue that some industries had more priority than others you know you to, <laughs> so so as a result there was no rational way and and so this is where arun shuri's uh, thesis also comes in because he precisely groups that uh, particular question uh, yeah how are you deciding the priorities yeah so even some people tell him that oh yeah yeah no some particular industry which is doing it Uh, or some ministry doing it say that no no we have the established priorities you know we have high medium and low priorities so then of course arun shuri being arun shuri goes and and further probes that yeah those who are actually doing the allocation are they using these priorities maybe <laughs> yeah. nobody is using there is no use of the priorities so so they they so bhagwati beside they will say that look you know it is not surprising that the agencies involved in determining industry wide industry wise allocation fell back on vague notions of fairness implying pro rata allocations with reference to capacity installed or employment or shares defined by past import allocations and similar other rules of thumb without any clear rationale right so yeah. ultimately when you can't figure out a, a set of priorities then uh, and, and and you know the reason you can't figure out the, the priorities is that 
the list of industries, and this is where it, the system gets really hairy, list of industries over which you have to decide priorities is so long. So Bhagavati and Desai actually, in, uh, in fact, go in just to impress upon the reader how difficult the problem is. They give a list of 123 industries. They have listed every single industry. And then they say that each of these industries is subdivided into another dozen, dozen and a half industries. So for one or two, they even give the sub industries. So just think about it, 123, if each one has another 10, it's 12, 130 industries. How are you going to decide who has priority over which? It's yeah. just impossible. There's no rational way for a bureaucrat yeah. to see the whole picture. And, yeah. and then also see, you know, what the industry license authority is doing and all. There is no way. It's yeah. completely so. So the Orwellian kind of characterization by Bhagavati and Desai is absolutely very apt characterization. And this is where then they say that, look, you know, ultimately they would say some notion of fairness. Ki are, you know, they've got this much capacity, so we should allow that. Uh, or they will make these rules that, uh, okay, this particular six months or this particular year, foreign exchange is in short supply. So we will give everybody, uh, uh, let's say, 60% of their capacity. Well, <laughs> why, why everybody 60%? They're not all equally productive or their products are not all equally desirable yeah. and so forth. So you know, everybody gets it because that's fair. Yeah. So this is how, you know, or, well, last year, how much did we allocate? So yeah, that was the typical the method. Of, yeah. Yeah. So, so, you know, you well on that. So it's not being decided uh, based on either efficiency or uh, of the uh, uh, desirability of the particular product, uh, you know, where excess capacity is less valuable, where excess capacity is more, val uh, more valuable. None of that is playing. It's basically uh, these, these decisions, you know. So, so Shuri, for example, is a very good <laughs> quote, which, which uh, uh, appears, you know, from his, so you're right, his thesis was written in 1966 at Syracuse University. So, yeah. so, uh, so he, this is Arun Shuri, uh, as quoted in Bhagavati and Desai, saying that the extensive interviews with development officers, industrial advisors, the deputy director general engineering, and the director general revealed that in fact, no formal and detailed categories of industries between high, medium and low priorities, nor of the principle on which priorities should be assessed is in use. A list was compiled by the deputy director general in 1962, meaning list with the, these industries and priorities, but it was never used and it has never been brought up to date. Yeah, you know, but you know, one part of it is that it's very complicated and there is no criteria. But the other part of it is, you know, that whole Mises Hayek impossibility of socialist calculation, right? It's not just that it is difficult to do, it's that it simply can't be done. Uh, the nature okay. of the problem that they are trying to solve, which is to substitute a rational allocation through market forces with a bureaucratic allocation, you're simply not going to be able to calculate your way out of it. Uh, because now you've said that prices and profit and loss are irrelevant to your allocation. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right? And, so and if is, you have price that, controls yeah. and you don't allow for profits and, you know, so all that is happening through the industrial licenses and control system and price and quantity controls, which already exist in the market. So once you don't rely on prices and profits, <laughs> right, what is the rational basis for allocation? I mean, there simply isn't one. So then you you have to replace it with something. And in some sense, you know, some of the more honest bureaucrats, they did their best. They poured over the 123 categories and said, you know, a little bit upper niche from last year's allocation seems about fair. So, you know, you're tinkering. And some of the less honest bureaucrats are just going to make something up and, and give it to the people that they favor. And everyone can now indulge in their biases. But still, the problem, I don't think, is with the with the people involved, I think the problem is just the system. They, they place you and me in the system and all our collective economics knowledge is going to collapse, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, and, uh, absolutely. There is no doubt that it couldn't be done. It just yeah. couldn't be done. So, <laughs> so on that, you know, so when ultimately it go to the firm level, right? I mean, yeah. Uh, 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 yeah. so 
Panchmukhi, uh, uh, the old trade economist, you know, yeah. uh, he had this wonderful study that he got some firm level import data. Yeah. Uh, and, and then tried to correlate it to profitability. And in many cases, he found the, the, the correlation to be negative, you know. <laughs> the, it's the guys who are least profitable <laughs> were managing to get the foreign exchange. Uh, and the ones who are profitable were not getting it or getting much lower allocation. So yeah. <laughs> uh, it's not surprising. I mean, you know, it could go any anyway, you know, maybe there yeah. would be no correlation also. But uh, but that was uh, how it was, you know. Uh, uh, it, it, it was basically a, a, a problem uh, which could not be solved. So therefore you had to seek ad hoc solutions. And, yeah. and, and for the bureaucrat, you know, what, what is most worrisome is that somebody will raise the question, yeah, and so you have to be there. You have to have your criterion, you know, which is transparent. Yeah. At least you can answer. So it says, yeah. so so you say, uh, I whatever I did last year is what I did this year. So that is yeah. defensible. Uh, apparently, uh, 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 there was you know during the uh, China war, uh, they had to because foreign exchange was required for uh, defense related uh, uh, yeah. imports. So uh, uh, so all the regular imports had to be cut. So they did a proportionate, uh, largely proportionate uh, cut across all industries. I mean, that tells you yeah. that they were using the rule of thumb. You know, that's, that's, yeah. a, that's an evidence that Arun Shuri cites that uh, uh, they were using basically the, uh, the um, rules of thumb. Yeah. And, you know, I have to so, say there are two things I've read by Arun Shuri, which, are, which I recommend everyone reads this dissertation, you know, the one he wrote in 1966 and a later book uh, that he wrote called Governance, you know, which is about yeah, 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 read that his book. experience as a disinvestment minister. The lovely thing about Shauri is he's he does exactly what you have been doing in the last hour, right? Like do, not just saying we had this import control policy or something, but actually walking through the details and weeds yes. of who were the people yeah. involved, uh, you know, who were the bureaucrats involved? How did a file move from here to there? And that is when we are really able to put some actual visual to what, you know, Bhagwati and Desai have been calling Orwellian or Kafka S. That, you know, really comes to life in a way that it doesn't come to life when we just look at aggregate numbers or productivity yeah. numbers or firm numbers, right? Like the, the, yeah. the, the, the movement of this system, like within government and how it tightly controls everything. I think it's 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 worth knowing more. Arvin, this was absolutely fascinating. I mean, I know it, it this was a tedious job for you to prepare and tell us this kind of detail about how, you know, India dealt with the external sector, foreign exchange allocations, you know, import controls. So many uh, interesting things are coming out of this. And it's sort of almost like a nightmarish view of what was going on within the Indian economy at that time. Uh, so I think we will wrap it up here. There is a lot more tedious detail and then more scary conversation coming when we talk about exports and many other areas in the external sector. Uh, but, you know, hopefully that will lead up to a happy ending like liberalization. But, you know, uh, if, if you don't mind, we will carry on the conversation about tariffs and exports and continue this next time. Perfect. Let's do that. Uh, and we'll meet again. Thank you so much, Evan.